for that is God's love for us. And if we don't truly understand that, if we go to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, uh, Jesus explains, he said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it lists, and there thou hearest the sound, Therefore, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born in the Spirit. And what God is telling us there is, He loves us so much that He has found a way for us to become born again. He's made a way for us. The next scripture is John 3, 16 and 17, which should be familiar to almost everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. As I started to research this, I was amazed at how much, if you sit back and take this all in, how much God really loves us. How much he loves the world and the great extent that he goes to to show us. The next verse that we're going to talk about is going to be John 14, verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will make come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So God's saying that really what we need to do is listen. We need to listen and keep his words. When we do that, the Father's going to love us to death. And if we don't, he's going to cast us out. The depth of God's love is just immeasurable. Our next scripture is going to be John 16 verse 27. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. So there again, Jesus is affirming the fact that his Father loves you because he loves you and that you believe that he is the Son of God. Our next lesson is going to be in Romans chapter 5 verses 5 through 8.
And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of our God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For, scarce, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And again, it just goes forth to show that even though he didn't know us, even though it was 2,000 years ago on the cross that he died, he died for us today and for the future. We stay in Romans for our next reading, and that's going to be Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, it is just, the, these scriptures are just a reaffirmation of exactly how much God loves us. He's telling us that nothing can separate us from his love. Our next lesson is going to, our next chapter, or verse is going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen for us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Next reading will be in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But for God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewithin he loves us, The next two readings are going to be in 1 John. One John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And then we go into 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not... Who? Excuse me. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest, manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, 
Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the <coughs> preparation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. These are just scripture verses that show how much God loves us. You and me. All we have to do is love him back. Keep his word, read his word, and study his word. For when we know what the Lord is speaking to us, we know exactly what we're to do, and how we're to do it, and when we're to do it. As I researched God's love for us, I came across a whole another section about love. And that's the love of Christ. Not only did God love us, but Christ loves us. And when God and Christ love us, he sends the Holy Spirit down to guide us, to lead us, to protect us. The next five readings that I'm going to do are all going to be in John again. Uh, these are going to be about how Christ loves us and for our love of Christ. And the first one is John 11 verses 3 through 5. And this is showing how, uh, the f this first reading is showing how much Christ loved Lazarus and his family. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified therein. And now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when they were upset with, the, with Jesus because Lazarus had died, he told them, now don't be upset because this is for the glory of God. And we all know the story that Lazarus was raised up from the dead. And it was just another example that even though they kind of chastised God for, or Jesus for not being there quick enough. He was there in God's perfect time. And he was not angry with them because of the emotions that they felt. And he does the same thing with us. He, uh, he's very forgiving of us from the times that we're very impatient with him. The next reading is going to be from John 13, chapters 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have loved one another. And he certainly makes it very plain on there that we, because he loves us so much, we need to love one another. And uh, in a lot of cases, sometimes that can be difficult. But yet that's what he's commanding us to do. The next reading in John 14, chapter 31, or uh, I'm sorry, John, chapter 14, verse 31. But 
that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. And again, it's, it's just a reaffirmation of what we read in uh, John 14, uh, I'm sorry, John 13, verses 34 and 35. That he's telling us, he's given us a commandment. It could actually be the 11th commandment, we're to love one another. The next two readings are going to be in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So we see in this chapter where even Jesus himself had to keep his Father's commandments, had to abide in his love. And it uh, certainly if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. And again, it, it just goes to show you how deeply God does love us. And he keeps repeating this over and over and over. The next verse is going to be John 15, chapter 12, or John chapter 12, verse 15. And again, it's a reaffirmation. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Because of how deeply he loves us, he also comes back over here in Romans 8, chapter 35, or I'm sorry, chap Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers can come. And again, that is just another form, just as we read that back in the love of God, this is the love of Christ, just reaffirming all these. Second Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So basically, that is just telling us that when Jesus rose from the dead, he gave us eternal life. That if we're in him, we died with him on the cross, and we will have eternal life if we keep God's word. Our next reading is going to be in Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And again, this just keeps going back to the same theme that God 
gave us a way to live eternally. Even though we're sinful man and we have our faults, that when Christ was crucified, we were crucified in him. The next reading is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which patheth path knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then the last scripture reading that we have is going to be in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Christ, or from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that love us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We could go on and, and read probably another 50 different Bible verses that deals with how much God loves us. But all we have to do to truly understand that is to look around and see how every day God blesses us. There are days when we might get up and think that he didn't bless us very much because of things that have happened. Circumstances that have been created. But when you stop and think about how much God loves us and how much he blesses us each and every day, it's hard not to just absolutely break down and say, God, I'm a sinner. I don't know why you love me so much, but thank God that you love me. Because without you, I don't know if I could make it through the day. It was funny, this morning is right after my alarm went off and I was laying there in bed. <clears throat> and I thought, here I am in bed with the three people that love me most. My wonderful wife who puts up with a lot for me. My dog who thinks I'm the greatest thing in the world because I take him out and feed him and walk him. But God. Sitting there laying in bed and I'm thinking, boy, here I am. I'm in a nice, warm, dry house. I've got food on the table. I've got family that loves me. In spite of me. And I've got a God that I can turn everything that troubles me over to him. And I don't have to worry about it. And I know there are times that might frustrate my wife. Because, Don't you ever worry about anything? Not much anymore, because you know why? I know that God's going to handle it. All I have to do is turn it over to Him. And I learned the secret of that was to give it all over to Him. Too many times we hear people come back and say, Oh, God doesn't love me. He never answers my prayers. Well, a lot of times when we're praying for something, we give them 95% of it, but we're going to help them with the other 5%. And I want you to stop and think about this, because God created the heaven and the earth, all of the creatures, all of the universe in six days. Do you really think he needs our help in solving a financial problem or in solving a family problem or even solving a health problem. We have to learn to be strong enough in faith to say, okay, God, you got it. It's yours. I don't have time to deal with it. I've got other stuff to do.
I watched a uh, minister that was on TV here about two weeks ago, and he had given a pretty good teaching on this. And he had used some examples that will stop and make you think about exactly why do we worry when we can turn it all over to God. And it made me stop and think, if it's that easy, why doesn't everybody do it? And the reason I believe that God showed me is people do not want to give control of their life over to God completely. They're willing to give them a portion of it. But they do not want God to be in control of their life 100%. Yet that's what God wants. He wants control of our life. He wants control of us from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. And then at night he takes control because he will give you dreams and he will give you visions. All you have to do is welcome them. Now I sat back while I was researching some of these and to truly understand the depth of God's love, you really need to understand everything that Christ went through when he was being crucified. The pictures that we see on the TV and in the movies, with very few exceptions, show him nailed to the cross. Maybe a little bit of blood running down his face from the crown of thorns. But that was not the crucifixion that Christ suffered. He was beaten, stabbed. Uh, the one account that I read on there from a researcher who uh, had gone and done a lot of in-depth research about the crucifixion said that he was beaten beyond recognition. That had you not known who was on that cross when it started, you would not have known who he was when he was actually placed on the cross and crucified. And it makes me stop and ask the question, would you do that? Would I do that for a complete and total stranger. A better question, yeah, would I do that for somebody that I knew? Maybe even a family member. I'd like to think in my heart I would, but the actual fact of the matter is, would you actually do that? Back in the days when Jesus was alive and walking the earth, they were some brutal, brutal times. My last lesson over here when we talked about the apostles, some of them suffered some brutal, horrific deaths for, for just following the Lord. So you can imagine the death he must have suffered being him. Yet, while he was hanging on the cross, he said, well, not your will to the Father, but mine. You know, not my will be done, but your will. <coughs> it makes you stop and think about the two thieves that were on the cross alongside of him. The one that accepted Jesus for who he was, and the other one that scoffed at him. We have the advantage today of knowing who Christ is. We have the advantage of knowing all the things that he can do if we just give him the opportunity to show his love towards us. I see some of the things that happen in the world 
not just here in the United States, but especially over in the Middle East, some of the terrible things that people do to one another, basically in the name of religion. I think they said as of the end of the year there was five million Syrian refugees that had fled prosecution or persecution from ISIS and some of them were even Muslims who ISIS didn't feel were Muslim enough. Many of them were Christians. Some of them were Jewish, not many, but some of them were. And there was a whole smattering of other religions that were involved in there. And yet, even with all of this said, we look at what we have here in the United States, where you basically don't have to worry about being persecuted because you go to church. Or if you go to the flea market and witness the people there, or at the farmer's market, or whatever. Yet we're the first to complain mm -hmm. about how bad we have it. Right. Well, folks, I got a news flash for you. You think it's bad now? Hold on to your seats. Because right now, probably more than any other time since the early beginnings of the Christian church, Christians are being persecuted more and more and more. And the persecution doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be decapitated or they're going to be killed or crucified or anything else. But if you pick up the newspaper almost every day, somebody is being just literally ripped apart because they said something that was of Christian value. Right. Somebody spoke out against homosexuality or same-sex marriages, mm -hmm. or abortion, or whatever the hot topic of the day is. And they come back and they say, oh, he's a radical. We've got to love one another. It's true. It says right here in the book, we have to love one another. We don't have to love the lifestyles. We don't have to love the sins. Right. We need to love the person. And while they may complain that the Christians are discriminating against them? Are they not discriminating against the Christians for being allowed to practice their faith? The world needs to realize that this is becoming a two-way street. And if you want to go throw stones, you can expect to get stones thrown back at you. The other night there were a couple of the politicians that were on TV and they were talking about the uh, Republican primary in, in South Carolina. And the one guy was asked, well, you know, I know you support Hillary Clinton, yada, 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 but if you had to vote for a Republican candidate, who would you vote for? And the guy turned around and said, I'd kill myself first. Which may have been for a laugh because he was a political satirist. But that person may carry way more weight being in the public eye than we give him credit for being. He may hold sway over people who may not really truly understand everything that he was saying. 
Yet I don't see the people from the Christian movement, or at least not very many of them, standing up to refute the kind of things that are being said. If we're to walk with God and we're to seek out His love and to follow His word, we need to be willing to stand up against this kind of nonsense that goes on day after day after day. The more you sit down and read out of Scripture, the more you realize that the things that God has spelled out in this book are all coming to pass now. People, I think, years ago read this and said, oh, that's going to happen 200 years from now. But the beginnings of it are happening right now. All you have to do is pick up the newspaper, turn the TV on, pick up a magazine, whatever it is. So many of the things that had been prophesied all the way back from the Old Testament are now coming to pass. And what we need to do is we need to have ourselves geared up to teach the unbelievers that are out there, and believe me, there are lots of them, how to accept God's love, how to understand God's love, and how to practice God's love when we're dealing with other people. Two weeks ago, I was sitting in a uh, waiting room of a doctor's office. And there was a woman in there that came in with breathing problems and we struck up a conversation with her, and uh, after my wife got called in to see the doctor, right before she got called back, she said that she was also suffering from cancer. Not of the lungs or anything. So I said to her, I said, well, I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And just then they called her in. So I prayed with her and her husband, it wasn't a long, elaborate prayer, but it was a prayer for healing. And after they went into the office, I was sitting there, and there was a, a gentleman who obviously had many physical problems. And he was sitting there in his wheelchair, and he was talking to a woman, not sure whether it was his wife or his mother or who it was, but... Anyway, I heard her commenting on the fact that I had prayed in the waiting room with this lady. So I reached over, and they were sitting right in front of me, and I said, would you like prayer? And the woman says, no, no, we don't believe in this kind of stuff. So I said, okay. So I sat there and prayed for him anyway. He might not have known that he was getting prayed for, but he was getting prayed for. Not only did I pray there for a healing, but I prayed for a better understanding of the, from these people that exactly all that God can do for us. I find out the more willing a vessel you are, the more opportunities that are placed before you to pray for and to witness to people that you meet every day. Some of them you may not even realize need prayer until you start to talk to them. When I first started being way more open in praying for people and stuff was seven or eight years ago. And at first I was very reluctant for fear that the people would reject what I had to say. It's gotten to the point anymore where I just about expect it, but you go right ahead and pray for them. The only difference is I've noticed in the last couple of years there's more and more people 
fit welcome the fact that you're going to pray for them. I think more and more people sit back and they see the things that are happening. They see the things that have changed and are continuing to change. And I believe these are the precursors to the masses that are going to come in once revival starts. There was a, another, I believe he was, I, I know he was a minister, but I believe he was also held a doctorate. And he even said, he said, the churches today are not prepared for revival. He said, they're not going to know what to do when thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are all trying to get the truth at the same time. And he spoke very openly about the fact that the smaller ministries are the ones that are leading the way in providing the people that are going to guide and lead and direct the masses when the time comes. He spoke himself about how the mainstream churches are more interested in being politically correct than they are being in scripturally correct. that how so many of the denominations are just bending everything that's in the Bible to suit whichever avenue they decide they want to go down. Right. When I first started studying about Christ's love, I thought this is a pretty easy subject to discuss. Everybody knows God loves us. But God also put a lot of caveats in there. Stuff that people don't realize. Yes, he loves us, but there is a price to pay. And it's not in dollars and cents. It's not in any kind of physical goods or anything. God wants your heart, pure and simple. He wants you to obey Him. Obedience is the key to being able to follow God. And obedience is not always an easy path. When we sit back and we see some of the things that he's given us, like John 15, 12, that this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. I know it's a hard path to love somebody that has really done something bad to you has really hurt you. I know it's easy to come back over and say, yeah, I forgive them. But you have them. They're words. We need to get in to God's Word and study everything that He has to say about love. how to obtain it, what to do with it once you get it, how did you show it. Make me stop and think about how many different ways we have today to express our love to somebody.
it has gotten so that we have, you know, before if you somebody did something for you and you wanted to thank them and show them your love, you got a card and you wrote in it, you know, hey, thank you so much for whatever it is. I really appreciate it. I love you. Today, well, I'll shoot them a 30-second text. Or, I really don't have time right now. They know that I love them. And a lot of times it can hurt that somebody will not take even two or three minutes out of their busy day to acknowledge the fact that you've done something for them, that you love them, and they just, eh, whatever. That's why it's important when you get into the Word, you find out how to acknowledge the fact that people love you and what to do with it. One of the true facts that we have about today and about electronic communications, people, especially the younger people today, have lost the ability to communicate face to face. I don't even remember where I was, but it was several months ago, I watched two people that were sitting on one side of one another texting each other. You can see it when you go to talk to somebody, especially the younger generation. They don't know how to speak to you face to face. I'm sure they, if you'd let them text you, they be able to express themselves wonderfully. But we have lost the ability to communicate one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. What would happen to us if God all of a sudden lost the ability to communicate with us face to face? You wouldn't hear any more messages from God. You wouldn't know how much He loved you. He wouldn't know when you were doing good or when you were doing bad. You'd be out there in the twilight zone. It's interesting to watch people. I love to watch people. And uh, the other evening we were in a restaurant and this couple came out. And they were older, probably not as old as I am, they were older. And uh, they came in and they sat down and, and they went up and got their food. And the very first thing they did once they got back to the table was they held hands and said grace. And I thought to myself, that's something you don't see much of in restaurants. Right. You probably don't even see much of it in households right. anymore, but especially in restaurants, because nobody wants to show their love for God. It seems that when you start to communicate with God, especially if you're out in public. Some people are turned off by it. Some people don't understand it. And some people are even offended by it. Well, I say to the people that are offended by it, is I'm offended to your type of music that I hear with the windows rolled down and the vibrations coming out of the car are strong enough to bust your eardrums and the trash that you listen to while you're doing it. So remember, it's a two-way street. 
God's love is all-encompassing. If you'll notice in these lessons, there was absolutely nothing in this lesson that said God limited his love to he loved the way you prayed or he loved the fact that you go to church or he loves your car. God's love is all-encompassing. When we're right with God, God loves everything about us. The only thing I've sat down in these last five or six years tried to figure out, how can I get more of God's love? I want God to love me if I can't stand it anymore. Because, you know, the world needs love. It needs love to the point, not just for gratification, but for survival. When we don't have God's love, we are lost. If God didn't love us, who could we pray to for help? If God didn't love us, where would we get all the blessings that we have each and every day? If God didn't love us, how would we know how to love one another? The simplest thing in the world, the most heartwarming thing in the world, and if you really want somebody to be taken back, just walk up to them and say, God wants me to tell you that he loves you. Because 99 out of 100 people, if you do that, then they're going to stand there with their jaw open. Like, God loves me. The other 1%, if you go up there and tell them that, I'll say, yeah, tell them to send more. Tell them to send more. I love him too. So just remember, when you get up in the morning and you're laying there in bed and thinking, boy, I got to get up out of bed and I got to go and face another day. Just think about the people that love you before your feet even hit the floor. And just remember, even if you don't have a dog, or even if you don't have a spouse, God still loves you. He's there with you from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night. When you realize that you have somebody with you 24-7, 365, that loves you, that loves you, that loves you. It makes it a lot easier to start the day on a positive note. The rest of the day may go down into the toilet as things happen to you, but at least you know, God loves me, and I started the day off as good as it can get. God shining down his smiling face on me saying, I love you. And the trick is not to let the rest of the world take that love away from you any portion of the day. I just thank God every day that no matter what happens to me during the day, all I have to do is say, God, Giving this over to you, help me. I can't do it alone anymore. God showed us how much he loves us by providing a way for us to have eternal life. God loved us so much, he gave us his son to give us that ability to have everlasting life, to be born again, to be born of the Spirit. 